Welcome, everyone. I'd like to thank Chris Azinovic to be with us and uh, give a talk on Risk 5 is inevitable. Uh, Chris is a professor on, in EECS department at the University of California at Berkeley. He received a PhD in computer science from UC Berkeley in 1998, then joined the faculty of MIT and received tenure in 2005. He returned to join the faculty at Berkeley in 2007. Uh, his main research areas are computer architecture, VLSI design, parallel programming, and operating systems design. He is currently co-director of Berkeley Adapt Lab, tackling the challenge of deploying custom silicon to meet new application demands. He leads the free RISC V is a project, ISA project, is chairman of the Risk Five Foundation and co-founder of Sci5 Inc. to support commercial use of Risk Five processors. He's also associate director at Berkeley Wireless Research Center. He received NSF Career Award and uh, is an ACM, ACM Fellow and IEEE Fellow. Thank you for being with us, Chris, and uh, the talk is yours. Welcome. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me okay, just to check? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, thanks for inviting me here to give a talk. Um, uh, I wish I could be there in person. I'd love to come visit Brazil sometime. Um, but the talk today is about why RISC-V is inevitable. Uh, so, um, and really, the, the, I view my talk as kind of a public service announcement. Um, I'm not really here to sell you RISC-V, more to inform you about what's happening in RISC-V. And also, when you're planning your future computing endeavors, to be aware of this. So. Um, RISC-V is inevitable. It's going to have the best processors and the best software ecosystem. And I'll sort of go through my talk. I'll basically uh, show you why th these things are true, why these, why these things are going to happen with RISC-V. So I'll start out with, you know, um, what is RISC-V? <laughs> For some of you, this may be an introduction to RISC-V. Uh, I always find it useful to go back over it because even those people who think they understand RISC-V often have some misconceptions about uh, the, how it's organized, how we how we do risk five. Um, then I'll go through the points about why risk five is inevitable. Then I have a couple of technical points, um, sort of updates on risk five. Uh, and then, then we'll conclude and hopefully have some time for questions. So I'll start out by saying, you know, open standards are nothing new in computing. They're sort of accepted practice almost everywhere else in the computing stack. We have open standards. Everything from networking, where we have Ethernet. Um, operating systems, or you have a POSIX interface, is an open standard. Uh, C language standard is an open standard. Um, database, query language, graphics interface. So all these are examples of standards, open standards. And for those open standards, you have free and open implementations, but you can also have proprietary implementations. So, you know, a surprising thing happened not too long ago where the POSIX interface was made available on Windows, for example. So it's an open standard with a proprietary implementation. And of course, for C compilers, there are the open source C compilers like GCC and LVM. And there's also the um, proprietary commercial compilers like Intel ICC, ARMS compiler, et cetera. Now, what's curious. Chris, one, one second. I think you're not sharing your main screen. We are seeing oh. your PowerPoint only. Okay, let me, uh, let me try and fix that. That changed? No. Yeah. Okay. We see the same, but now we see your table with the uh, open interfaces. Um, okay. No, you're not seeing the right thing still. Let me try and. Uh, oh, maybe you are. Hang on. Actually, let me go back. Sorry, it's a little hard for me to go full screen and see what's going on.
looks like it's still. Yeah, wait, wait, I think you can continue like this. So you just need to change the slide manually instead of pressing any other kind of key to move forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm curious why the, are you seeing the full slide? Yeah. Is that better? No, I mean, we see the PowerPoint only. Do you have multiple screens on? No, it's just the way. Unfortunately, Microsoft hasn't given you a simple way. It's somewhere deep in the, uh, I forget, there's a way of telling it which windows to use uh, in slideshow. Is that a view? Uh, that's the button I press, but then I have to. This usually works. It's not uh, something about this presentation. Sorry, let's try to get this going. Yeah, we still see the PowerPoint, but oh. yeah, if you, right. yeah, yeah, so I don't know how to fix this. It's uh, usually it works. I don't know why this one isn't uh, something wrong with how I'm sharing. Marketing news and all, you know. Okay. Uh, Chris, maybe you can share the full screen and then uh, first start the presentation, then share the screen. Try, try this order. Oh, it's good. Yeah, trouble yeah, yeah. Like, I can't see that. I can't see that. When I do that. When I do that. When I do that. Let me try a different thing. Let me. Uh, Nope, it's doing the same thing. Uh, that's frustrating. I don't know why it does that, and there's no setting to. Turn off presenting tools. Uh, I don't know why it shows you something that I can't see. It's sharing something that's not visible to me. Um, it's not the presenter view, it's something else. No, no. 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 Chris, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, are you by any chance clicking to share only a window and not yes. the full screen? Yes. I don't think that would be possible. If you try to share the whole screen and then start the presentation, yeah, I okay. think that would work. Yeah, I think it usually works. I do this a lot, but I don't know why this particular presentation is not. I have to. The trouble is, uh, uh, I have a lot of stuff. 
on my it's hard to do that i usually just share the app and it usually works i think it was something with this the way i've created this file some reason it's not uh doing the right thing okay, let me let me do what you say let me just take a little second Deixar que eu tô, eu tô ligando e desligando aqui. Tá, tá. Deixa esse aí, pode deixar. Okay. Yes, everything seems fine now. Thank okay. You. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, I might have to kill it if something shows up that you shouldn't see. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, so we talked about open standards, let's carry on from here. So, you know, previously we haven't had open standards at the instruction set level, right? And this is kind of curious given how we have open standards everywhere else in computing. Now the other, so that's one aspect, uh, why don't we have an open standard for instruction sets? The other bigger problem is maybe that's not an issue. It's okay to use a proprietary instruction set. The problem is that those companies that own those instruction sets come and go. So some examples, um, you know, there used to be a big, powerful corporation on the west, the east coast of America, Digital Equipment Corporation, very important computing company. And they had some important instruction sets, including P2P11, VAX, Alpha, but that company's gone now, you know, due to bad business practice, bad management of the company. Um, Intel, although it's around successful with x86, there's all the other instruction sets it also had in the past that are also gone, i960, i860, itanium. Uh, people might not realize that Windows NT was originally the first port was for the Intel i860, Intel's RISC processor, uh, but that's gone. Um, Spark was actually one of the early classic RISC designs. Um, and to their credit, they actually did make this an open standard in 1994 uh, with an IEEE standard. Uh, the 32-bit V8 Spark was made an open standard and several companies made chips around that standard. But um, the company was then acquired, Sun was acquired by Oracle uh, version V9, the 64-bit was not made open, and then Spark development was closed down in 2017, so Spark is now dead. MIPS was another one of the early classic risks, um, had a very tortuous past, it was sold to imagination, uh, then it's bought by a startup wave, and now it's MIPS. Again, they tried opening up the MIPS ISA in 2018 after seeing the success of RISC-V, um, one version of the ISA, but then they closed it down again in 2019, and now the MIPS of the company is now selling RISC-V based processes, RISC-V ISA. IBM, uh, another one slightly later, one of the risks, um, IBM still selling power systems. They tried to open up the ISA in 2019, but it was not quite clear which version and how they were opening it up. Um, and really you hear nothing about this anymore. So open power is really not, there's no energy in that ecosystem, nothing really happening there. And IBM still has a lot of control over that ISA. ARM is obviously a big popular instruction set in the, the soft core space, um, mobile space. Um, there was big shockwaves in the industry when they were sold to SoftBank in 2016. And the question is what's gonna happen to this uh, architecture that everybody relies on now that it was being bought by a, a private entity. Um, and uh, then there was further shockwaves in 2020 when NVIDIA announced they were trying to acquire ARM, um, but that deal fell through in 2022. Um, uh, but now ARM is going through the process of seeking an IPO. So there's a lot of uncertainty about ARM's ownership that's also causing concern uh, amongst folks. And so the big question here is why are people entrusting their software investment, which is the biggest cost, um, to proprietary ISAs when the ISAs come and go? And as they come and go, you have to keep reporting your ISA, your code to the different ISA. Um, so that's one issue that if we keep a proprietary ISA, we're just beholden to whatever happens to the company that owns the ISA. Um, a different problem on SOC, systems on a chip. Um, chips today have more than one ISA on them. So if you look at it, when you say this is an ARM chip, well, really, there, there may be an ARM applications processor that's the most visible to the programmer. But there are all the, uh, these other processes, graphics, image, radio, audio, security, power management. It's not unusual for there to be a dozen different instruction sets on a single piece of silicon. Um, and so a good question is, why are there so many instruction sets? Well, one reason is um, 
why don't they all just use ARM everywhere? Well, the applications process uh, instruction set is too big and inflexible and doesn't make a good base for the other kinds of cores. Like if you're building an audio DSP, you don't want to implement a full application processor instruction set. Um, another big reason is that even if they wanted to, they're not allowed to use that ISA because it's proprietary. So um, you cannot be used by others' IP blocks. So for example, if I'm a company selling an image signal processor, um, I cannot just incorporate somebody else's instruction set in there without a license. And I can't resell uh, their core or my even my own core designed to their instruction set. And so what happens is, Every IP provider has to come up with their own instruction set because they need to sell that IP separately from uh, others. Um, and you know you should realize in these big chips, most of the IP on a chip comes from other places. The people who make the chip usually are buying the IP from many sources, right? And each of them has their own ISA. And finally, another really bad reason is engineers like to build their own instruction sets. Um, and this is a really bad idea um, because uh, you, you find the software support is the, is the real cost. And the engineer is also not that great at building ISAs. It's, it's a subtle skill. It takes time. And so um, there's all kinds of problems when you let your engineers build their own instruction sets. So really, do we need all these different ISAs? Do they have to be proprietary? Do they have to keep disappearing? And so the premise behind RISC-5 is there's just one stable, free, and open ISA that everybody can use for everything, right? That's the idea. So how did this start? Well, RISC-5, the background, uh, back in 2010 in my research group, we were looking at what instruction set should be used for our set of research projects. So this was just ourselves at Berkeley figuring out what to build for our own research infrastructure. Um, the obvious choices were x86 and ARM, as they were back then still the most popular ISAs out there. Um, but really, they were both impossible to use. Um, x86 is too complex, and there's IP issues, as we'll get into. ARM was a bit simpler, um, but mostly also very complicated. Um, and also back in 2010, there was no 64-bit version, which is what we wanted for some of our research and also the very strong IP issues around using ARM as well. So we decided to build our own ISA. So we started this three-month project in the summer. Um, and I'll just give a, a shout out to the main designers, Andrew Waterman, Yun Sub Lee, uh, Dave Patterson, and myself were the principal architects behind RISC-5, although many people have helped since then. There's many, many people involved in RISC-5 since then. Um, it took more than three months. Uh, it was more like four years. Um, but we didn't just sit and you know pontificate about ISA design. We actually did multiple silicon tape outs. We um, iterated on design. We ported the compiler. We ported the operating system and just iterated uh, several times until 2014 when we felt it was good enough to announce to the world. Um, now the name is Risk Five and it's pronounced Risk Five, not Risk V, and that's because it's the fifth major Berkeley ISA. So Dave always regrets not keeping the RISC brand to mean the Berkeley project, because the term RISC was originally coined for the Berkeley project, RISC-1 and RISC-2. Um, so these first two uh, designs uh, were done in the early 80s. Then there were the follow-on projects, SOAR and SPUR, um, which we've gone back and renamed RISC-3 and RISC-4, and now we're on to RISC-5. And the first RISC-5 tape out was in 2011, in uh, 28 nanometer FDSOI. So one difference between RISC V and the earlier RISC projects is that the earlier ones were just a single implementation. They were designed for a single chip, and that was it, a single research prototype. Whereas RISC V, we designed as an architecture, and there's been many, many implementations of RISC V since then. So back in 2014, we decided it was time to announce to the world. So at Hot Chips, uh, we made a big uh, promotional push for RISC V. Uh, everybody ran around wearing these, these blue T-shirts. Um, had a very strong reception. So industry was very receptive to the idea of an open ISA. Um, and so then we um, uh, started work on uh, RISC-5 outside Berkeley. So one thing the industry told us was, this is very important, this is good, but we need it to be outside the university somewhere stable for the ISA. So then we created the RISC-5 Foundation, which is now transformed into RISC-5 International based in Switzerland. So RISC-5 International is a nonprofit organization that manages the standard. So RISC-V is a, international is a standards body. It defines the specifications. All the membership come together to figure out how to evolve the ISA and what's going to be in the specifications. But RISC-V International does not have the implementations of RISC-V. It's only about the standards and the specification. We wanted to keep RISC-V uh, international neutral with respect to all the implementations. So now, um, there's a lot of members, hundreds of members. Most of the big names in computing are a member of RISC-V International. 
Um, you know, big name that joined last year was uh, Intel, uh, also finally joined RISC-V. Um, so just to understand how RISC-V works, so the RISC-V International really sits at the center of the world and manages the ISA specification, golden formal model, and compatibility suites uh, to test the, that your implementation matches the spec. Um, and this is really the interface between software and hardware. So the specifications sit in the middle. And so one common mistake people make in thinking about RISC-V is they say that RISC-V is an open source processor. And that's just incorrect. So RISC-V is not an open source processor. RISC-V is an open standard. Now, because the standard is open, it means that you can have open source implementations. And so there are many, many open source cores. I think the last count, well over 100 open source RISC-V cores you can go and download from various folks all written in different hardware description languages, different styles, different scales of implementation. But that's not all you can do with RISC-V. RISC-V, again, is just an open standard. There's also a lot of commercial core providers. So at this point, there are um, maybe several dozen companies who provide licensable, royalty-bearing, you know, commercial cores with support that you can incorporate into your SOC design, just like any other commercial core IP. And in fact, there are more commercial IP providers for RISC-V than for any other instruction set in history at this point in time. Um, now, as well as these avenues, because it's an open standard, companies can do their own in-house cores. So companies like NVIDIA have built their own RISC-V cores for use on their GPUs. And so every GPU shipping now has RISC-V cores on it that were custom designed by NVIDIA for their own use within that core. Another example is Seagate who built cores for their disk drives, the SSDs, um, and those cores are used by Seagate on those products, right? Um, now you're also seeing not just the cores, but whole pieces of silicon, uh, commercial silicon based on RISC-V coming from a, a large number of companies, some startups, some more established companies producing RISC-V silicon that you can just go buy off the shelf. So the great thing about this hardware world is, uh, the RISC-V world is all those hardware vendors, there's many of them, but they all follow the common standard. And so they all share the common software ecosystem. So on the software ecosystem side, there's a very strong showing in open source software. So RISC-V is well supported by all the main uh, upstream open source uh, projects such as GCC, Linux, uh, BSD, and so on, LLVM. Um, but it's not only open source software. Again, uh, there's a very large uh, growing commercial software ecosystem. So companies like Lauterbach, Sega, Green Hills, uh, Wind River, they provide commercially licensed software. You have to pay for this, but it's ported to RISC V and runs on RISC V, and they're responding to demand. So their customers that use these tools are doing projects with RISC V now. And what you're seeing is these companies responding by providing um, the support that the, the customers need to use RISC V in these projects. So again, RISC V is not an open source processor. RISC V is an open standard, but because it's open, you're allowed to do open source processes, and you can uh, support the open source software ecosystem. But also, a large part of the success of RISC V is due to all the commercial activity that's going towards the same open standard. Right? So, predictions of growth of RISC V, I think they're um, uh, wildly underestimating what's actually happening. Uh, but this is an independent research group went around and talked to companies about what's happening with RISC V, and their prediction is there'll be over 60 billion RISC V cores shipped in a couple of years. Um, um, I think you should view this as very conservative. There's probably well over 10 billion RISC V uh, cores shipped in the last, uh, in 2022. And this number is just going to keep growing. Um, so it's it's not a um, just an academic thing right now. It's, it's mainstream commercial use of RISC V. As an example, you can go to AliExpress and you can buy a RISC V microcontroller for 10 cents US. So a 10 cent microcontroller. Um, is now available, just go download it. You can buy, this is a batch of 50 for five bucks, right? So this is the, the extent of which RISC-V has gone to mass production, right? So obviously RISC-V is important in education. It came from the academic world. We used it in classes early on uh, in teaching and in research and the major books uh, being based on RISC-V and most of the top schools in the US at least are using RISC-V in their classes and that curriculum tends to spread around the world. You know, people uh, copy and use the slides in the labs. And so uh, we were, we're estimating well over 10,000 undergrads a year are being taught RISC-V in their computer engineering classes. So it's really, you can think of that pipeline of students being trained in RISC-V at the universities, then coming out into the 
the workforce to, to make, make systems around risk five sort of pause here and sort of go over why is risk five so popular and uh, especially when i talk to engineers um they they get confused and they, they're trying to understand this um and i think engineers sometimes don't see the forest for the trees um so the reason is not because risk five is technically superior right i wish i could say that and in some respects it maybe is but that's not the reason it's so popular um, it's not because it's a bit faster or a bit lower power for some implementation the reason it's popular is because a different business model um, because you have an open standard whereas previously you didn't um, so now you know in the commercial space this means that if somebody's building a chip um, they can first specify the instruction set they want and then go ask a vendor to compete for that socket on the chip Previously, you would figure out the function you wanted. The vendors would give you their IP, and you'd have to deal with whatever instruction set they had, and that'd be a proprietary instruction set. So now it may work okay the first generation chip, but when you're successful through the second generation of that chip, you kind of locked into that one vendor because you picked their ISA for that block. Now you have this freedom to pick your ISA first and vendor later. Another thing that people like is the flexibility. You can add custom extensions without needing permission from anybody. You can build a core that has some special function on it, and that's fine. Um, and you can use all the standard part of RISC V ecosystem and add your own customization on the side. And the other great benefit of an open standard is the commercial, academic, open source communities can all converge around a single standard and really leverage each other's work and build build on that. So this is why RISC V is so popular. Now, I think another thing people don't understand is um, ISA business models. So um, when comparing, even when they compare x86 and ARM, people don't realize it's really apples and oranges what they're comparing. So these three ISAs are very different business models. So x86 is a microprocessor business model. All you can do with x86 is buy chips from two companies. AMD and Intel will sell you silicon. You cannot build your own x86 core. There's no way of getting a license to do that. That's just illegal. You cannot sell a soft core for x86. That's just illegal. You cannot add your own instructions. You cannot open source an x86. Okay, so the only thing you can do is buy silicon from Intel and AMD. Now you can ask them to build a custom chip for you. Some of the games uh, makers have done that. But again, you're buying the silicon from AMD and Intel. That's all you can do with x86. Now, ARM is quite different. ARM licenses um, their IP, and you can buy silicon from many people. And there's many vendors who sell ARM-based silicon. You can also get a license from ARM to allow you to build your own core. So for example, this is what Apple does, is they make their own ARM cores based on the license from ARM, but with their own microarchitecture design. Now, you can also license a soft core to place on your own, your own silicon. But you can only get that from one vendor. Nobody else is allowed to sell ARM IP. So for example, you may think, oh, ARM has, uh, Apple has a great ARM core. I'd like to use the Apple ARM core on my silicon. Now, first of all, Apple won't sell it to you, but second, they're not allowed to. Even if Apple wanted to, they could not ship, they could not, they could not sell that IP to anybody else. Only ARM is allowed to sell soft IP for ARM. Uh, you cannot add your own instructions, though in some cases they started to add a little bit more flexibility in response to RISC V. Um, and you definitely cannot open source an ARM core, right? So this is the restrictions ARM places. Now, RISC V, there's many vendors making chips. Um, the architecture license, the ability to build your own core, that's free. So if you want to um, build your own RISC V core, you don't have to talk to anybody. You can just go ahead and build your own RISC V core. However, many people building SOCs uh, want high performance uh, cores with many features and they want support. And so you would go to a commercial core provider and there are many vendors now, as we saw, of commercial supported licensed royalty bearing IP, right? You'll have to pay to use this on your silicon, uh, but there are many vendors who will support you in doing that. You can also add your own instructions. You don't need permission. And there is many open source core IP available as well, if that's what you want to use. Right, so you know, basically, risk five is the ISA that likes to say yes. So if you want to do it, you you can do that with risk five. Okay, but again, it's it's an open standard. It's not only an open source uh, implementation. There is many uh, paths to using risk five. Now, what's important to think about as we think about business models is how the semiconductor industry is changing. Um, it used to be more of a horizontal model. Now it's moved to a vertical model, and I'll explain that. 
So what's happening is companies who build products uh, using silicon, instead of build using standard parts, they're moving towards uh, using differentiated silicon in to build their product. So an example, Apple, it's an obvious example, Samsung, Amazon, they build their own silicon for their products like TVs, home speakers, wearables. Same for phones. Um, same for cloud servers. The cloud service providers are doing custom silicon um, for their cloud uh, service. In cars like Tesla, they build their own silicon for the car. Now, the thing to realize here is they're not selling the chip, they're selling the product. Like Apple doesn't sell chips, it sells iPhones. Apple, uh, Tesla doesn't sell car chips, it sells cars. And the end system value increase they get from the custom silicon is what justifies the chip design cost. It's not just chip sales. So that's what I mean by vertical model. So companies are doing everything in the stack, including building the custom silicon to make their product better. And that's what they justifies the cost of doing the chip design. And they need um, the ecosystem to support that. So what you see is the foundry model, soft IP, all the CAD tools, but that's the industry that supports these companies building this custom silicon uh, for their products, right? And this is where ARM has been very popular in supporting this, uh, this style of design, right? So now that's the first part of the talk uh, about RISC-V, introducing where it fits. Now let's talk about why I think it's inevitable. Um, what, one way to look at this is what happened with networking. So the distant past, there used to be many different networking standards, DECnet, IBM Token Ring, FDDI, for example. Uh, but now there's just Ethernet, in effect, as the standard for networking. Um, and really, the big reason RISC-V is inevitable is industry wants an open standard ISA business model. So the, the big drive, everybody understands this is a good thing to have in the industry as a whole. And that's why they're aligned behind RISC-V as being that open standard at the ISA level. Um, and the other thing is once you have a high quality open standard, you don't move back to a proprietary single source standard. People invest in the open standard, the companies come together, they improve that single open standard and move on. So if there's anything missing, anything broken, now the motivation is there to keep working on this one common thing we've built rather than having multiple proprietary standards. Now, the second point here is RISC-V is gonna have the best processes. Um, now what's happening is, I mentioned at the beginning, it's not, it's not really happening because of a technical advantage, but now that it is happening, people are seeing that there seems to be a technical advantage to the RISC-V ISA. We were careful in designing it. Um, and what we're seeing now as, you know, with folks building high performance processes and evaluating them against other high performance processes, it seems that we're getting much better power performance area um, compared to other architectures cores in this space. Um, we get the highest performance, the best energy, the smallest area by using the RISC-V ISA around these cores. Now, I think it's still too early to figure out what's going on here, but this seems to be the case that there is an advantage to the RISC-V ISA. I'll go over some of the reasons we may expect that. Um, the second reason why RISC-V might have, well, we're expecting we'll have the best processes. There are many vendors competing for the sockets. So there's competition. So this competition drives innovation. So you cannot you know, rest on your laurels with a core design. You have to be worrying about, or your competitors are also trying to improve the performance of these cores. Um, so in a sort of general process of market, there's a lot of competition. The other way that quality improves is there are, there's room in RISC-V universe for companies that focus on a certain niche. And in that niche, they can provide a customized core, for example, for automotive or for space or for uh, very low power wearables. So companies can focus on one area and because they're focusing on that one area, they can optimize for that space and end up with a much better processor design for that one space, one niche. Um, this is something that when you only have a single vendor, they cannot provide, they cannot cover the whole market economically. Right. So RISC-V being an open standard allows it to be a whole ecosystem of multiple vendors, all specializing in different kinds of RISC-V core, which enables then RISC-V to have the best processes across the whole space. Right. So the two point series, we think the ISA is inherently um, more efficient than the previous architectures, but also there's many people building RISC-V cores, which improves the quality. Now, one thing people are not aware of, haven't been aware of as enough, is they're thinking, well, RISC-V is just for embedded microcontrollers. Well, it has been. That's where RISC-V has been adopted initially. But there are many companies working on high-performance, super-scaler, out-of-order, vector-capable application cores. 
And this is just a short list of the folks working on this. And I know there's a few more around there um, building very high end cores. I'm going to just because I know this is the best. I'm just giving an example of you know recent Sci-5 core release. This is our 600 series. So this is a uh, quad issue out of order superscalar processor with vector pipelines, um, hypervisor support, um, sophisticated interrupt handling, uh, multi-core, um, trace and debug, very security features. Um, you know, 12 spec in K per gigahertz um, with much less area than the competitors, right? So this is the kind of cores that are coming along in RISC V universe. And as I five, this is one we've released. We obviously have higher performance uh, um, future products also in development that'll be coming out soon, right? So you should not think of RISC V only as a low end cores, but also competing at the uh, soon to be the very highest end cores. Um, you know, and the Microarchitecture looks like every other superscalar out of order microarchitecture. You know that all the features you'd expect to see. Um, so RISC V is competing at all in all sectors of the computing universe, right? So where does this, some of this ISA efficiency advantage come from? We've been trying to look at this. Our customers have been doing the comparisons. Obviously, say it's Sci Five, we're not allowed to go look at um, competitors' IP, but our customers do the compare. And they've been asking us, why do we seem to be better? I think as we analyze it, this is still early days. Um, some of the reasons we see is the compressed instructions. We have reduced dynamic code size. We have a combined compare and branch instruction instead of a separate compare and then branch as in the other architectures. Uh, we work very hard to really be risk and keep out complex instructions from the base ISA. So for example, all of the integer instructions in RISC V only read two integer registers. Uh, and there's no condition code flags. Um, this might seem like a small point, but when you're building an eight issue or wider issue processor, uh, if every instruction could read more than two integer reads, that's that's a problem for scaling the design. So really there's a lot of things we did to make it scale up to the very highest performance levels. Um, we had the advantage of a clean sheet design. We could avoid some of the problems that we saw in earlier architectures. And the other important thing is we designed it for extensibility. In particular, we put a variable length instruction set as part of the original design. And we could sort of tell a future this was going to be needed. And also we have the advantage of the whole community helps design this. We have the leading experts from academia and industry. And the folks in industry are folks who design the other instruction sets. You know, they're now working on RISC-V. It's not like a separate group of new people building RISC-V instruction set extensions. These are the folks who define them, but the other architectures now working on RISC-V. So they have that background and experience. And there's really no limit to the performance level application domains of RISC V. And it's going to, next two to three years, you're going to see RISC V be surpass all the other architectures in performance and uh, quality of implementation in terms of power and area. So, one little technical detail I drop into, I think a few minutes to dive into this. Uh, why are RISC V instructions in variable length? So, one of the original RISC um, project uh, philosophies was that instructions would be a fixed 32 bits wide. Um, the problem is a modern instruction set doesn't fit into 32 bits. And you see this when you look at what's happening with say ARM and IBM power, where they have to add these prefix instructions now um, to accommodate basically vector and matrix and more SIMD extensions. So these are actually um, 64 bit instructions, but they've had been encoded inside this 32 bit container. And it's a bit clumsy because the ISA was not designed to be extended out past 32 bits. Um, also, I mentioned this example before where a compare and branch has to be fused for good performance. And so effectively, ARMS had this, what's really an eight byte instruction sequence uh, for a long time. Um, and static code size is critical for embedded applications, but it's also, people don't realize dynamic code footprint is really important for servers and apps processors. So Google, for example, published a paper where their web search engine on x86 spends nearly 14% of the time just waiting for the iCache misses to come back. So this is not branch predict, this is not other things, this is just fetching instructions from memory, right? So variable length is really, when we designed RISC V, it's really only a sensible choice for a modern ISA that has to be efficient and extensible, right? It's also high performance. I think we deal with a lot of designers coming from other risk architectures, and they go through this, you know, the stages of grief about supporting variable length. Um, because they had this bag of tricks they've used for fixed with risk instruction sets, or they were really hurt by their experience trying to build variable length x86s. Um, but RISC V is much simpler uh, variable length than these other schemes. Um, I think after mine, people, Simo Cray had variable length instruction sets in the Cray machines, and he was somebody who would not compromise on performance. Um, so he used them for performance. 
Um, and the, the, for performance, they help because they give you effectively one and a half times the cache and TLB capacity and one and a half times the bandwidth for fetching instructions over internal buses. Um, we see this in the products we do, that uh, there's a big advantage to having these compressed instructions there. And the support, the pain of supporting them is quite small compared to the advantages you get. And as I said, we designed it to be easy to decode. You know, decoding eight instructions per cycle is fine. We do that today at high frequency. Now, allowing those, the other thing is the greater than 32-bit instructions allows more performance optimizations. They'll be coming in future RISC V enhancements. I want to go back to one of the other themes in the intro. Um, remember this notion, we're building SOCs. So co companies are building SOCs customized for their products. They're adding a lot of specialized units on those SOCs. And one of the things we can do with RISC V is remove what we call ISA balkanization. And this is this fragmentation because different cores on the chip have different ISAs. The goal is with RISC V that all the cores on the SOC can be based on RISC V from everything from the main app scores to the microcontrollers. RISC V was designed, the project we built RISC V for was all about specialized processing. That's why we built RISC V in the first place. So it's ideal for building these customized cores for specialized tasks. Um, and you can source your IP from many vendors, but now the, the advantage is everybody can use RISC V. Uh, there's no prohib prohibition. In fact, we encourage vendors to use RISC V. And so now as you assemble your IP for your uh, chip design, all of it can be using RISC V. So that allows you have a common software and tool stack. And the big benefit here is um, the software stack for any individual random ISA is usually quite poor. So it's hard for a small company to support um, rich software and maintain all the tools. Uh, but when all the companies are using the same tools, you have a shared investment in debug tools, tracing tools, um, all these other tools, compilers, linkers, assemblers, everybody's sharing. So you have higher quality development environments for these embedded tasks for all these other cores because they're sharing the same ISA. And also the companies that support these, for example, the uh, Lauterbach, Sega, IAR kind of companies, they can share their investment across all these different cores that they can support now commercially. So it's a big advantage to avoiding this uh, balkanization. And so, you know, a joke about this, all oh, your core belong to us. This is this famous quote from a, a mistranslated uh, text in a game. Um, so application cores, graphics, image, AI, ML, radio, audio, all these will become um, RISC-V is the, is the prediction, right? So now the final point in why we think it's inevitable and why it's gonna have the best ecosystem is that it's gonna have the best ecosystem. So this follows from the other points, um, the largest number of people using RISC-V, all the cores in the system are becoming RISC-V. Um, and also software wants to run the best hardware. So as we have the best processors, software wants to run if you're building a mobile platform, you'd like to have the best battery life and see one of the best performing core for given energy usage. Um, and in RISC-V world, this is still evolving. So the hardware and software are being co-evolving rapidly. Um, and it, this takes some time. So it's people sometimes are frustrated at how slow it seems to be going in RISC-V land. Some of them are not familiar with silicon design cycles, which are many years. Um, but we're starting to see this come out now, the silicon developments and the core developments uh, being public and people seeing how much RISC-V has advanced. Um, and as the advantages become critical, there's a snowball effect. As people see the advantages, more people will move to RISC-V and we're seeing that happening. Um, and the ecosystem is maturing rapidly. Um, I think one thing that always shocks me when I think about it is there is, if you look back over the last few years, there's been very little RISC-V hardware to use. Like there's almost, almost zero development boards compared to any other architecture. But look at the maturity of the software ecosystem, even without all that development hardware, right? So we've come so far because of the enthusiasm around RISC-V, even lacking the hardware we would expect to have. And you know, I, I can say that the COVID put a lot of um, constraints on the supply chain and so really hampered RISC-V development boards getting shipped. But even with all of that, we have a very advanced software ecosystem considering how little development hardware has come out. And now you're gonna start seeing a lot more RISC-V hardware come out. And this is gonna further accelerate uh, RISC-V software development. So next year or two, you're gonna see a lot more development boards appearing on mass. Um, another big announcement is Google supporting RISC-V. So they announced this at the summit. They gave some further advancements in Barcelona last week, um, but things are advancing quickly in RISC-V ecosystem. One example of what happens when you have hardware. So back in 2018, 
um, Sci Fi uh, released the uh, Unleash board and gave this to the distro. So Debian took this board, and the axis here along this axis is weeks. So you see week 22, week 24, week 26 in a year. And this is a percentage of packages ported to RISC V. And you see, as soon as they got the boards, how quickly they caught up with all these other architectures. And now it's a mainstream supported architecture there. So this is, you know, just in a few weeks, they managed to bring up all these packages and pour them over to RIS-5. And now it's a mainline supported uh, distribution. So the um, other thing people bring up about RISC-V is there's, there's these worries that are being promoted by, um, you know, frankly, a lot of uh, people would not like RISC-V to succeed. And one of the claim, one of the worries they put out is that there's a lot of fragmentation. Everybody can do their own thing, so how is software going to work? This hasn't really been a problem in practice. And I want to explain, uh, people often confuse fragmentation and diversity, right? So to me, fragmentation is a bad thing. It's when you do the same thing in different ways. So to me, the classic example is you know, left-hand drive, right-hand drive cars. You know, humanity really doesn't need two different ways of placing the steering wheel in a car, but we do. And so now manufacturers have to cope with these two variants. There's no real benefit, it's just a cost. So this fragmentation is bad. Diversity on the hand is we have a different problem to solve. So if I'm going cross town to pick up some groceries, a bicycle is a fine thing to use. If I'm trying to carry 500 people across an ocean, I don't want a bicycle, I want a jumbo jet, right? So in this case, the differences come about because you're solving a different problem. Like having the same solution for two different, these two problems wouldn't make any sense, right? So diversity is important, it's the way you address, and with RISC-V, we're gonna be addressing a much wider range of problems than any other architectures had to do because we're gonna be universal used everywhere, right? Now, the way we're avoiding fragmentation, which I said is bad, um, I think there's two powerful forces which people seem to ignore, but which are really powerful. Um, one is users. Um, the users do not want to repeat a vendor lock-in. So they're very careful about not getting locked into a vendor, right? Um, the other one is software. Software is so expensive to develop and maintain. Not even nation states can afford to do a fork of the software base. Um, and the upstream open source projects are only accepting things that obey the frozen specs from the RISC-5 International, right? Um, so the reality is you, you might think, oh, vendor wants to go off and do their own thing, but then they're back to supporting their own software stack. And that's one of the major costs that they avoid by staying with the standard, right? So these forces are really powerful to avoid fragmentation. Now, diversity is a good thing, but it still can be a problem. Um, so in RISC-5, we had the basic model of there's all these base ISAs and extensions, and anybody can combine them any way they see fit. But for some spaces, it's good to package up the options so there's many, many fewer choices. And that's what we're doing with RISC-V profiles. In particular, when you're trying to build a rich software ecosystem with a lot of third-party shipping binary pre-compiled software and applications, you need much more uh, uniformity across the space. So RISC-V, you have these profiles. And for example, the application processes, RVA20, RVA23, um, these tell, for example, a distro like Debian or Red Hat, compile all your binaries, assuming these things exist. And then the hardware implementers are required to implement all those for that software to run. And so what we're doing is really constraining what you can put in a RISC-V system by these profiles. And that's the way you manage fragmentation or uh, diversity in these spaces where it matters. Now, again, there is still this custom cores where it, people do want to customize, and that's still fine and valid. It's just that for the rich third-party software ecosystems, we do need to provide these profiles to manage the um, diversity. Another thing we do is working on platform standards. This is actually the hardware platform as opposed to the software profile. So saying like, for example, um, the hardware platform will have an IOMU, will have an advanced intra uh, architecture controller and things like that. So we're focusing on initially a rich OS platform for Unix-like systems um, uh, for this uh, initial platform standard. So I already mentioned a lot of this about profiles. Um, these really provide a unified view of the ISA roadmap for rich OS. Um, so there's many mandates, fewer options, and a much simpler software target. So I just want to conclude, wrap up, leave a bit of time for questions. Um, I, you know, I'm trying to place what's happening with RIS-5 sort of historically. So I think every era kind of has a dominant ISA. Um, so when transistors became the, the way you build computers, really IBM 
designed the 360, and it really was the very first instruction set. So IBM came up with the idea of an instruction set when they developed the 360, a single standard interface, but many different kinds of implementations. Um, and they developed this along with the emergence of transistors as the main building force. And I think they really dominated the whole transistor era mainframes with the 360. x86 really dominated the microprocessor era. Here is where we had integrated circuit technology and you could come with this business model of selling a chip. Um, and x86 through sort of historical accident with IBM and the PC, they came to dominate in the microprocessor uh, era with x86. Right, where you bought the standard piece of silicon that was a whole processor on a chip. ARM really came to a dominance in the mobile era. And the mobile era is where companies like TI and Nokia worked together to build chips for phones. And they knew they couldn't do all the work of building a processor. And so ARM came up with the idea of a soft core licensing model. So they would license the core, including a phone with all the other components on a phone. And really ARM has benefited from being the main ISA of the mobile era. RISC-V is really designed ideally for this vertical semiconductor era. Now people build silicon that's specialized for that product. And they need not just application cores, they need all the other supporting cores, and they would like them all to be the same ISA, all customizable with a common standard. So that's really what I think RISC-V is fitting into um, the sort of design uh, evolution as technology evolves. That's really where RISC-V is going to be the standard here in this, this more vertical era. Okay, just to finish and wrap up and repeat, um, risk five is inevitable because industry wants this business model. That's why it's inevitable. People want this to happen. Um, because of that, people it's gonna have the best processes. Uh, we think it's an inherently better ISA, but there's also competition with more vendors competing for business with more, more core design for more niches. It's gonna have the best ecosystem um, because there's the largest number of people uh, working in this space. Everything is gonna become risk five over time. And software wants to run on the best processes. So that's why RISC-V is going to have the best ecosystem. Okay, I think that's it. So I'm happy to take questions for a little while. Thank you very much. Um, we have some time for questions. I saw that Guido already have a question online here. And uh, if you have questions from YouTube, you can write your questions down. And if you have questions here, you can also ask questions here. And we pass to Christian. Guido, you can start now and uh, we go on. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks, Quest, for the interesting talk. Particularly, I like that slide with comparing the business model. It makes, makes something really clear. And um, I have two questions, but let me just put a little bit of, of scope on that. Uh, we have been working on with IBM Toronto Labs on uh, compiler code optimization for the Power 10 Matrix Multiply Assist uh, unit. Uh, we designed some of the optimizations there and the code generation for that. And we definitely think that those ideas could be eventually uh, moved to the RISC-V um, uh, ecosystem. Uh, so my question is, uh, are two actually. The first one is, uh, what, what is the, the time frame for the MacBook extension? And um, uh, also, uh, and the, the second one, which complement the first one, uh, is, is it going, it's going to take like the path uh, taken by T hat with any new proposal, or it's going to go beyond that? Right. So at risk five, we do everything you know through a community process, right? So there is a there is now a vector SIG, um, and, and Jose Marrero from IBM is the chair of that SIG, um, and that's the one that's uh, managing the matrix uh, extensions for now. So there's they've just started a series of meetings to go over the different proposals for matrix extensions. So um, you know, that group will decide, you know, with the community, what we do for matrix extensions. Uh, I'll just point out there's, I think there's two classes of um, uh, matrix ops that people do. One is um, matrix within vector registers, um, which is also similar to how NVIDIA does the tensor cores um, effectively, or, or there's the sort of um, uh, separate set of matrix registers, new state, and we you do matrix operations in a new state, which allows usually much bigger uh, operations. So I think both those will end up in RISC V in some form. I think it's actively being discussed how to do that. Uh, for example, at sci fi our, our intelligence cores, we have our own custom instructions that do the matrix out of vector registers already. Um, and uh, I think it'd be interesting to see what people choose. Like we've, we've been looking at these options. I think both will end up being done, matrix out of vector registers, as well as separate matrix state. Um, it's an interesting area. There's a lot of demand for things like this, yeah. 
So I think, but the, the vector SIG is the place to, to go to to find out what's happening. The risk five. All right, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Guido, and uh, Chris for the answer. Do you have any question from the auditorium here? Uh, okay, I have I have one extra question, Chris. Uh, you also have experience with software synthesis tool and uh, silicon flow, and uh, you mentioned some of the steps that is required to make the the design flow a little faster, and also experience some of this in, in Sci Five. Can you talk a little about this also, and how Risk Five may join in this effort? Yeah, so, uh, well, one thing I say is in terms of uh, silicon design, uh, you know, RISC V doesn't make any of the place and route anything. It's, it's all the same tools using the same thing to get RISC V onto a chip. However, what we're seeing is um, when we do the hardening and the course, you have the original RTL design. Um, you know, for example, in Verilog, you'd have a description of the chip. Then you have to uh, harden that to the, the silicon. And the PPA hardening, um, RIS-5, for the equivalent performance, we're finding it's a bit easier, it's a bit less stuff. So it's a bit easier to place and route and optimize um, uh, for RIS the RIS-5 cores at the same performance level. But I don't think there's anything really different about RIS-5 in terms of CAD flow, except that um, there's more options, uh, right? There's more more things available. Uh, more, if I'm talking broadly in the industry, people now can shop along a much larger set of places to go buy things to include in their chips. In the actual hardening process, I think it's just the same um, as any other IP or architecture when you go through the flow. Now, Berkeley, we've been working on, you know, more advanced flow methodologies. Um, we use RISC V because that's what we have, but they would apply to any other architecture also. So ways on building, um, like there's a problem now with the, the silicon vendor tools are very hard to use. We've tried to make them easy to use and make it easier to port designs between technologies and vendors. Um, but that's a sort of orthogonal effort um, at Berkeley on uh, what we call Chipyard. So Chipyard is a whole system we build to help people make SOCs. That's all open source and available. People want to go take a look. And at the bottom of that, there's the hammer flow, which is the part that helps you get through um, vendor tools to get to silicon uh, more easily. Okay, thank you. Um, we don't have, uh, do we have any question from here? Leonardo? Can you come here to talk? Hello there. Uh, what would you suggest like for a master thesis if we want to research on risk -free? What What would be your suggestion for someone who is like starting this and so? Uh, uh, <laughs> also infinite also number of projects. Um, one thing is risk five, not risk -free. Um uh, so uh, I think to start, I would look at doing some analysis first. So when you're doing a project, diving in and building something is fun, but I would start out looking at existing designs and analyze them, trying to find a problem to work on. Um, so um, for example, look at instruction mix or uh, performance of some open source core that you can get and try and look for uh, issue, problems and issues and gather some data um, for a master's level project, unless there's people in the group already done things like this. I would start out by analyzing what's out there already, existing designs. And sometimes you can have interesting conclusions just by doing that. For example, you could look at risk five design decisions. Did we do the right thing doing this thing? Can you go measure it and see, um, you know, but it'll take a lot of work to bring up a core, get the software ported and running in your environment and gathering results you need. Uh, that'll take some time, but that's, I think for, especially if you have a research group um, around you, I think that's a good investment to get people going is just start by looking at existing designs and analyzing them. Uh, so do you have any other questions from people online? Yeah, yes. yes, you can you can ask a question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, my question is uh, a little more about uh, sort of the future and maybe a little bit of a more distant future. Um, of course, uh, when we're talking about um, everything actually in computing, everything evolves quite quite drastically and quite quickly. Uh, so if 
there is ever a need to address legacy um, instructions, do you have a, a plan already set to how, how, how to deal with that? Or is this something that's going to come up later and be discussed? Well, I, I think uh, it's a good point, and it's 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 not a far future thing. People already been exploring this. Uh, you know, as you're aware, for other architectures, they even going back to those early IBM days. Like so, when IBM brought out the IBM 360, uh, they had customers using their own earlier instruction sets, earlier IBM instruction sets. So IBM provided. In fact, uh, some of their machines, they had a microcode emulator of the earlier ISA. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the examples I like to point out is one of the first IBM commercial machines was the IBM 650, which was a drum-based computer. Had a very strange instruction set where you would, um, you could tell every instruction would say where the next instruction was. Um, and when they came out with the 1104, which followed that, they had an emulator, a software emulator for the 650 drum computer. So that software would keep running. And then when they came out with the 360, they had an 1104 emulator in microcode. So now the what people were doing, they were running the microcode emulation of the 1104, running a software emulation of the 650, so they could run the 650 on the 360. So this is a running legacy software is a long-standing tradition in computing um, for old instruction sets. And more recently, you saw Apple switch from x86 to ARM in their laptops and they built a translation layer with some enhancements to the silicon to help that translation be more efficient. So they have some extra features to model the x86 condition flags and they have uh, extra memory ordering facility in the hardware to model Intel's TSO model versus ARM's relaxed memory model. So yes, I think this will be a necessity um, and there are some folks who are looking at this, um, starting to look at emulating other instruction sets on RISC-V as well as there are folks looking at emulating RISC-V on existing other architectures also for development. Um, so yes, supporting legacy ISAs is going to be a thing. Um, it's been a thing for 60 plus years in the computing industry. It's not going to go away because software is the main cost in computing uh, development costs. So that's, it's a need to support it. Yes, and people will be doing that. Okay. I have two questions from the online guys and I will to ask this, the both at the same time, so you can choose. One is more technical and the other one is more strategic. The more technical one asks the why immediate encoding in RISC-V is so weird. And uh, the more strategic one and is how do you see RISC-V evolving in countries like Brazil? Okay, so okay. The technical question first, that's a bit easier. The immediate encoding is so convoluted to reduce the hardware cost. So um, once you build the hardware, you realize that it's saved in a very simple core, it'll save a bunch of gates. And the idea was um, in simple cores that are produced in you know, billions of units, saving those gates makes sense. Also somebody, if you build a soft core RISC-V in an FPGA, you will realize that you'll be grateful for those convolutions. They save a lot of muxes, which are terrible in FPGAs. The larger cores, it doesn't really make a difference. They're kind of lost in the noise, the savings you get. On the other hand, it doesn't cost software. It can be arranged the bits just fine. Um, so the reason is to make the simplest implementations lower cost. Um, yeah, we probably went a little overboard, um, but we kind of started a pattern with the original ISA and we followed that into the compressed encoding where it probably made less sense to be as uh, scrambled as it was, but the goal was to save gates in the simplest implementations. And people who build FPG implementations are grateful that we did that because they can see the reason. Um, it, it avoids a lot of muxes in the data path. Um, so the question about um, RISC-V in Brazil, I think um, there's a pipeline when you start up a new initiative. I think it starts at the universities, um, students, so the teaching material, I think the great thing with RISC-V is you not only have the labs and teaching material, but you have real designs, like real RTL people can get of the cores. You can see exactly cycle by cycle, bit for bit, how an out of water superscalar core works. I think that wasn't possible before. Nobody would invest to build a real RTL you could actually synthesize under an FPJ and run that was available to labs. So I think that's, um, you know, for developing the, the whole processor, design you know, culture in the country. I think that's where I would start with 
bring in the designs, bring in the labs, bring in the RTL for students to be able to look in detail how processes work. There's a, there's a worldwide shortage of computer architects. There's not enough people who understand architecture to satisfy all these projects. Like we've been saying, companies want to build products uh, that differentiate, um, but they don't have, there's not enough architecture design skills. I talked to many companies building things and it's clear there's a shortage of people who really understand efficient ways of architecting things. So um, in that level, RISC V can help just by making um, the materials more available to universities to use and more real materials, like a real core design that could be used in a commercial product that you can actually get the RTL and with a software available, commercial software to run on it. I think understanding you know, more real cores is a big, big benefit here. Um, also the low barrier to entry. So companies, you could have a local company supporting local development of IP. Now it's hard because you need a semiconductor manufacturing, you need uh, all these other pieces to really become independent in semiconductors. But a lot of products only need, like if you notice the, the chip shortage that happened uh, during the pandemic, which stopped a lot of cars shipping, for example, most of those chips are all the technology microcontrollers. And that's, that's a place that I think most countries around the world should be thinking about securing their supply of making sure they develop some of those silicon in country because in terms of trade imbalance, it's it's one of the worst things. That it's going to be a growing fraction of all products is going to be electronics. And if all of that electronics has to be imported to a country, it's going to be bad for that country's economy because they cannot afford, you know, just keep importing everything. You know, it's like oil or airplanes, or whatever. If you um, import everything, it's really hard to make it up in trade. So, you know, I really look at how do you start with um, microcontroller class products and try and source at least some of them within the country to try and make a dent in the, the otherwise it's going to be a very big trade imbalance in the future. Um, yeah, microelectronics are critical to all products. And you have to figure out how to um, supply some of those domestically. Yeah. Okay, so thank you again. And uh, I think we have to run out of questions. I would like to thank you for being with us and uh, for your time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Thanks.